My next guest is someone you will want to listen to. Sarah Dusick and her husband have built their glamping business from zero to a multi-million giant with 12 sites that successfully attracted investment to continue their vision across the USA in sites of outstanding natural beauty. Sarah shares her secrets to success and what she recommends for businesses just starting up. This is an episode you won't want to miss. Welcome to episode five. Welcome to the Glamping Americas podcast, the place for inspiration about the business of upscale camping, glamping and luxury outdoor guest accommodations. I'm Sarah Riley from the Glamping Academy and I'm working with my friends at the Glamping Show Americas to share everything you need to know about new trends, events, business models and investment potential in the rapidly growing world of luxury camping that delivers an experience. Interest in this industry is exploding, so if you want to be the first to find out what's hot and what's not, subscribe here and check out the show notes for more exciting news and links. And be sure to add the next Glamping Show Americas to your calendar for the 3rd and 4th of October near Denver, Colorado, and I'll see you there. I can't wait. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. It's fantastic to have a conversation with you. Again, we've chatted quite a few times, but your story is so interesting. I think we need to assume that people listening probably have never heard of you or the story before. And so tell me a little bit about the under canvas story. So much to talk about, so little time. <laughs> um, it is always a pleasure to share my story because every time I share the story, it helps me remember different things and ex- uh, and reflect on different things. Um, and so it's always, always a privilege um, to share. So if I go back in time just a little bit, um, we started a company that became called Under Canvas. It wasn't called Under Canvas originally um, back in 2009. So right on the heels of the great financial crash of 2007, 2008, uh, the world like it is right now uh was in turmoil financially um lots of you know heartache and loss and destruction in the world and you know people scratching their heads um and we ourselves um had pioneered a, a our first foray into business in the uk uh prior to coming to the states and it had failed um because of the banking collapse um And so we found ourselves in Montana, where my husband's from, with no money, uh, a failed business under our feet already. (laughs) But yet this this sort of insatiable idea that there was something out there for us um, and that we felt like there was something to this idea of that business could be used as a vehicle for doing good in the world and that business can drive change. And so we had started to see sort of the inklings of that with our first endeavor in the UK. Um, But the financial climate of the time just made the business not viable. So we went back to the drawing board and started to scratch our heads and then realized um, we had this extraordinary asset at our fingertips, which was my husband's family's farm. Um, And we had moved back there because we were penniless and had nowhere to go and had to move back in with family. (laughs) So effectively, completely down on our luck, right? You know, moving back in with your parents is never a good look when you're in your late 20s uh, with a child. Um, But that was was what we were doing. We had a six-month-old baby at the time um, and then had this crazy idea. Um, which was, could we recreate the African safari experience out in the wilds of Montana? I had lived in Africa in my early 20s uh, doing aid work. Um, And when I moved to Montana with Jake, my husband, I realized, gosh, there's so many similarities between Montana and Africa. You know, big, wide open spaces, incredible prairie, lots of wildlife, Um, And my husband, being the man that he is, you know, loves being out in that wilderness. And I did not love being out in that wilderness quite so much. (laughs) 
And so this, this we started to sort of play around with this. Was there something there? Was there something there with sort of the idea of Africa? Could we harness this land and use it somehow to, to generate an income? Could we protect it and not destroy it? Could we develop it without harming it? So we're asking ourselves lots of questions and we're sort of quite curious about sort of, you know, all the things that we were sort of realizing we loved and then realizing the disconnects we had between ourselves. And I was like, is there a way to sort of bridge some of these divides? Uh, you know, I'm a city girl, my husband's a uh, farm boy brought up, you know, at, in the wilds of Montana. Could we bridge that divide? Um, I had been in Africa and here we were in Montana with similar landscapes. Could we bridge that divide? And so what we realized was the answer was a as a beautiful tent. Could we create a beautiful way to stay out in the wilderness without it feeling uncomfortable um, or threatening or scary or, or, you know, not very pleasant? Could we create a beautiful experience in Montana? And so that really was sort of the birth story of of Under Canvas um, and of, of pioneering the idea of clamping in the US, which really didn't exist at the time. And no one was no one was talking about it. No one was doing it. Nobody definitely did not think it was a thing. Um, but it was something that we were curious about and, and something that um, we started to explore um, and see if there might be something there. And amazingly, there was. <laughs> it's been incredible the story of under canvas because you went from one site to now the company which i believe you'll still have some ownership of is now how many sites 12 12, 12 sites 12 sites yeah. across the us and each one is in an absolutely amazing location how did that come about that those locations were secured yeah well that that if we could sort of go back to the beginning of our scaling journey, um, we didn't plan on building multiple <laughs> sites until about 2012. So we were three years in from when we first launched. Um, and those first three years were were not wildly successful. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> uh, we racked up a lot of debt. Uh, did a lot of experiments and figured out well, a lot of what does not work, um, which was very painful. Um, but miraculously, in amongst all of that, discovered something that might actually really work and might actually have lots of potential for scale and, and growth and, and doing more than we'd first imagined. Um, and so when we when we created our first location in Yellowstone back in 2012, um, we realized, oh gosh, these this could be amazing. We could we could do this all over the country, um, and we could search for incredible places just like this um, in various parts of the country and and recreate a same a similar experience, but yet have a different experience because you're in a different um, geography in a different place. Um, so that was, I think, what inspired the sort of realizing we had a concept that could could be in all sorts of different places and different kinds of terrain and, and different locations. And so that sort of started um, the journey of thinking about let's let's build more than one. And, and in the early days, my family road tripped. We road tripped around the country looking for amazing spots <laughs> with two small children in the back of the car um, and often a grandparent in tow <laughs> to help us <laughs> um, while we went and searched for land. That sounds amazing. What an adventure. So, it was. It's crazy adventure. <laughs> yeah. But now you've managed to secure a huge investment, mm. and the canvas now goes to or gets the opportunity to grow with that investment and become so much more than, than it was before. And you can see it's almost like your other child, your business child, your company is now flourishing and becoming so much more. How, is, yeah. how has that been for you to, to see it go in its next step of its journey? Yeah, I, I often used to speak um, to the company actually about this with the sense that um, growing a company is like raising a child. 
Um, I often say to entrepreneurs now, don't don't love your business like a child because one day it does have to leave home and it's quite sad. <laughs> um, so remember that it's not a child, you know, keep it in perspective. But growing a business is very much like leading, you know, navigating life with, you know, you have an infant, then you have a toddler, then you have an elementary school child, and then you have a teenager and a high schooler and a then they go to college and then they then they're gone. And businesses are the you know hopefully the same in that they grow up and that they mature and they become their their adult independent selves and they become what they were always supposed to be in the world um and so it's quite magical actually to have imagined that from the beginning when you're sort of holding the concept in your mind and in your heart and you haven't built anything yet but yet you can see what the outcome might look like what you would hope the outcome to look like um uh, the, your fully grown fully grown baby if you like yeah so right back at the beginning of when you're coming up with your concept and you're focusing on where you want to grow and where you want to go would the advice now be yes okay we want to build our legacy we want to build a business that's going to become something but would you always think about that exit plan so how am I going to exit this and how am I going to move to other things is that something you advise people or or do you think that's going a step too far too soon I don't think it's going a step too far but but I might think about it slightly differently in that I I might rather than thinking about an exit I would think about um, what does your grown-up child want to look like? Uh, what do you want your grown-up child to look like? Because our children are an expression of us, right? They're different than us. They are not us, but they are a version of us. And they carry similarities. They may look like us. Um, you know, they may have features that are identifiable with us. Um, and they are sort of the next version of us, if you like, um, and building a business is, is much like that. And so thinking about what's the imprint that I want to leave or I want to build, what's the version of me that I want to leave out in the world, um, I think is a great place to start because, and I also think that's what will make it unique, right? Because we don't need another under canvas. We, we've got one. So we don't need another auto camp or another, you know, getaway. We've got one. Um, so how do you do something different in the space? And how do you create something that is an imprint of you? How do you bring your values, your um, perspective, your vision um, of, of what's possible out there and bring that to life? And so I think in this space in particular, creativity is so important. Um, and... I really believe for this space that this industry has so much power for moving the world forward. How much, um, how much we can change things, make things better, innovate, um, change standards, change expectations. It's all possible in this space. And I remember thinking when we when we first launched, one of the things we were really, really conscious of was we wanted to create access to wilderness spaces and to outdoors. But therefore, that meant, OK, if you're going to do that, you can't bulldoze the landscape that you want people to access. You can't be unthoughtful about how you develop in that space. And so that thinking was sort of very formative in thinking about, OK, how are we going to build? What materials are we going to use? How are we going to do construction? How much water and energy are we going to use and consume? All those things sort of informed and created the company that we ultimately built. And so my advice would be, think about what it is your grown-up version of your company would look like. You know, imagine it in minute detail. Like, you know, how, you know, how would it function? How would it operate? Craft a vision, because if you can see it, you can build it. And if you can see it, um, other people will be able to see it because you will start to make it happen. Absolutely. Excellent advice, because having that focus means that you really know the direction you need to go as well. Yes. And you'll yes. get there sooner, for sure. And I've seen it time and time again when people are wondering, what do I do next? Because they don't have that focus. Everything is delayed. Everything, you know, comes to a standstill. 
And I think that you're you're right as well about keeping it unique. We've seen that time and time again, that people who are in a very competitive market or the market is becoming more competitive, those who have just been copying what's been done before and they're just simply duplicating, they suffer the most because mm-hmm. they suffer from not getting those bookings from guests who are a bit tired of that model and they're looking for something a bit different something with a bit more of an experience and a personality and when you're saying that keep the personality of the owner in in your business I mean there is only one you isn't there so by keeping your personality in it you're keeping it hugely unique and that could be the very thing that differentiates you right that could be the thing that makes you stand out and create something really different that people are really interested in um because i i still think there's so much space and scope for growth in this in this arena we're really just scratching the surface um but you know we don't need a dozen holiday inn type brands right i mean we see that in the hotel space you've got holiday inn and it looks very much like the hilton and looks very much small minute things but like "Mm, really and so, you know, this needs to be the same. And how are you, how are you going to lead? How are you going to contribute something um, that's meaningful, a good differentiator, and really provide something to the general public, your customer, that they can't already have, can't, they don't already, they can't already get. Absolutely. So the word glamping is quite challenging in America because not everyone gets it. Some people have heard of it before and they think, well, what does this mean? What does a service, a glamping service mean? And and everyone's got a different point of view and and that's absolutely fine. What's your perspective of what glamping is and what it should involve and include having now successfully developed your business over the past many years? Yeah, I think that's a great question. For me, um, Glamping has always been luxury camping, or, or, you know, it came from the word glamorous camping. So for me, there always has to be an element of being connected with the experience of going camping. So if we lose all sense of uh, the elements that we would attribute to camping, then it's not glamping. Um, and and similarly, from with the with the GL at the front of that word, it has to be camping that's elevated. It has to be, um, it can't be camping. <laughs> there has to be some element that's sort of bridging that gap between a hotel room, a five-star hotel room, and, um, you know, wilderness backpacking uh, in the outback. Um, so what what are you doing to elevate an experience? And, and camping's an outdoor experience at the heart of it, right? It's about getting back to nature, simplifying life, being, you know, being outdoors in some way, in some capacity. And so glamping for me is about an elevated experience of of being out in nature. Mm. The other terms that are, you know, are frequently hearing these days are outdoor hospitality. I like that too. Um, and I, I think connected with that sense of there's an outdoor element there's a back to nature element but yet this is up upscaled in some way and and you know and we all know i think that's the unique thing about this space is up we could be one level up from camping we could be five thousand levels up from camping but there's but there's there's elements that connect it all together and how do you think the whole experience side of it really plays a part in in its popularity and I'm talking Mm. about not just the experience of actually staying in a glamping tent or a glamping cabin but Mm. the other side of the experience so the extras that maybe the owner the operator is adding to the service how important do you think that is? I think experiential travel is is where it's at these days Um, and I think the experiential component of well just being in the outdoors is experiential in itself because it's very different than how most of us normally live our everyday lives um so i think that's a big hook for what the glamping movement has got going for it because by its very nature it's an experience because you're doing something you don't normally do um 
but I do think um I do think there's something quite magical about um just do or maybe that's it just doing things we don't normally do being drawn out of our comfort zones to experience things that we don't experience in our normal everyday lives um that sometimes are quite simple things and basic things like sitting around a campfire like making schmores like going on a hike i mean they're, they're very simple you know they don't have to be extensive programming and you know complicated you know ideas they they just can be very simple but i do think um what many people are longing for and this is why i think experiential travel is such a big thing is we have become more and more disconnected um with all our technology and all our advancements in technology we find ourselves more and more disconnected so we're hungry for ways to connect with each other and we're hungry for ways to connect back to the natural earth and and be out in nature and feel connected again um with with our roots if you like even if many of us have never you know never felt like we really belonged out in nature there's still something about a connection with the earth that i think we all crave mm. and i think more so as well since the pandemic and people are now suffering from all kinds of health problems and mental health <laughs> problems and we know yeah. that nature helps us so good grow us. and get stronger so yes yeah. i th i think personally i think that it's going from strength to strength but what's your perspective yeah. of the industry in america at the moment and where it's going um i i don't know that i'm 100% up to date with everything that's happening in the industry at this moment but i can tell you what my hopes are for the industry because they're they're what they've always been in that my hopes are for this industry is that it would lead it would lead in environmental sustainability. It would lead us uh, in terms of better practices of ways of developing, the ways of caring for the earth, the ways of educating people about um, being out in nature and connecting. And so, you know, I hope that we will, because, because this is a space that's very innovative, I would hope that we would continue to innovate, continue to pioneer, continue to develop technologies that you know, can be uh, used in all sorts of environments, not just in this setting, but that we develop them for this setting that potentially have wider, wider uses. And I think there's so much we can do in the solar space and the water space and toilet space and shower space. I mean, it means endless. And this is the ideal sort of environment to create and recreate and do something new because no one's expecting you to do it like a normal hotel. Um, and so that's really my hopes is that we would continue to keep moving forward, keep setting new precedents, keep setting new benchmarks of of excellence and and of sustainability um, and that we wouldn't settle um, for just making money out of this. Um, I mean, that's that's my worst case scenario, really, is that this becomes a place that just people capitalize on, just make a lot of money out of. Um, that's never been the heart of this industry and I hope it never will be the heart of this industry because I think the creative power of it is so powerful and 99% of the people who want to work in this industry are passionate about what they're doing and why they're doing it and so that's really what makes me excited about it I think um, so yeah so I think those those are my hopes really that we would would be people who lead and and keep setting new benchmarks and keep holding account of you know the the big big cheeses out there the the big hotel chains that that need to do better um, and that we can show we can do better and so then it you know creates precedent for this is how you do this too. I really totally agree with you about that making money out of the industry and being too greedy. Uh, I think that that is a fear of mine as well. Uh, but I do think the consumer, the the guest, mm. the customer is very clever. They do understand that, you know, when yeah. they see a, a business lining up their huts in a row with a very small amount of distance between each one, because it's about packing guests into a small space yeah. rather than giving them 
room to breathe, room to be, room to have these experiences and, you know, enjoy outdoors in private, but in communal areas as well. I think they do understand that. And so they may be taken in at the beginning, but I think the consumer, the guest will understand which businesses think, they need to focus on. And I think you can feel it, right? You can feel when a, when the soul is, when the soul's not there. <laughs> right? We all feel it in all sorts of areas of, of, of our lives, right? When you feel like, gosh, that just, that felt pretty empty or meaningless, or, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was. And um, we see it all the time with things that we buy. Um, and when you, know, you spend, it's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes when you spend a bit more money for something, but you know, that brand has a strong ethos or has credentials that you really, really love and you connect with. And there's something about that brand that just really resonates with you. It almost, I'm not saying it doesn't matter what you pay for it, but it's like there's something much more powerful at work um, that that connects you with a brand like that than something that's ten dollars cheaper or hundred dollars cheaper even that has no soul. And so, and I and I, I agree. I think it's absolutely possible to tell pretty quickly which ones are which. So what do you think is happening next and what do you think are the biggest challenges for operators in this space? Um, well, I think you I think you alluded to it already in that this is becoming a much more competitive space, um, certainly more competitive than when when we launched because we were first. Um, so it's a different space now than it was a decade ago, for sure. Permitting is definitely getting harder Um, I think there's more regulation in place around this genre of development than there ever used to be. So that makes it harder. It makes it a more expensive proposition. Um, So I think that's that's potentially tough. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think I was listening to another podcast of of another amazing uh, female entrepreneur the other day and her little bit of advice in a completely different context was um, I I wrote it down here. It said, I like to go fishing in ponds where people are not fishing. And so I still think there's room for exploration here uh, to fish where other people are not fishing, to be creative where other people are not being creative. And as you said, I think the worst the worst case scenario of this industry is we just end up with a lot of rubbish copycats that uh, that are not just don't put out great product and don't have great ethos and you know are trying to optimize for all the wrong things so let's go fish when no one else is fishing that's a fantastic idea (laughs) and and so how do you think what do you think the best advice would be to someone who's starting out from scratch now would it be to focus on your brand and be different would it be to focus on your experience would it be to be more creative in and how you're developing the overall vision for your business? Would it be finding that place where you can go fishing where there's no other fisher mm-hmm. people? Um, what would you think would be the best bit of advice? I would, I would probably ask myself now, what is it that you really want? What is it that you're really trying to achieve? And most of us can't answer that question very well. We can't actually say, uh, we're not actually very good at dissecting our own motives um, or even saying things out loud and owning them. And I think actually it's really helpful whenever you're starting a journey to be really clear about what you're trying to do and why. Because if we understand why, you can unpack it a little bit um, and get to the bottom of it and figure out, is, is that is that a, is that a good reason? <laughs> is this is this am I going to be successful if that's my motivation um so I'd I'd ask myself some good questions it's like I I I mean I can't tell you many people are who reach out and ask me all the time for advice and I ask them this question and they don't know and I say well have you thought about whether you're whether you're trying to have a particular lifestyle by, by going into this business, are you wanting a lifestyle business? Are you wanting to run sort of an outdoor, you know, B&B kind of scenario? What, what, because it helps you define what you're trying to create and how you're going to operate what you're going to create. Um, and if you want to build a big brand and build a big company, like, you know, ultimately we did with Under Canvas, that's a very different thing than saying, 
I want to have a lifestyle where I'm serving guests and, you know, we've got a small piece of land and, you know, it's completely different. Those are completely different animals, right? So, so getting clear on what you're hoping, the outcome, you know, and the other thing is to say, if, if, if the driver is, I really want to make a lot of money, I would definitely advise go and make that money somewhere else. This is, it's, it's not an easy space to do that in. There are plenty of easier ways to make money. Um, so I think just getting clear on your why. Why do you want what you're thinking about? And there's no there's no right or wrong to that, but it's just about getting clarity. It's about understanding what you are trying to build. And then you then that tells you how you should build it and what kind of partners you need or what kind of people around you or what kind of employees or, you know, it, it informs so many things. So um, get clear on what you really want because the reality is lots of people love the idea of going into business in this space but it is not as easy as it looks it's not as glamorous as it looks um and it's and it's it's not even a lifestyle that many people actually want when they really think about it so i think getting clear about you know i, I get solicitations almost every week from people saying we built this glam site it's quite successful but we don't want to run it it's killing us it's horrific um, so, so get clear about what you want and why you want it. Mm, absolutely. And also, if the tweak, the business model that they're following needs tweaking, they can tweak it to fit their yes. evolving needs as maybe their family grows or their priorities change. There's always a way of doing it. And I've known business owners who have started out doing it all themselves and now they've employed managers who are doing it all for them. And they're almost like a sleeping partner, which is almost ideal. They can dip in and out. But you know, that takes a lot of management and is depends that what you want, doesn't it? it depends yes. if you know what did you want to achieve? What is the ideal outcome for you? And then you can figure out, you work backwards and go, okay, how do we get there? What does that look like? What, yeah. what makes that possible? Map it all out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you are now not constantly working on, on under canvas. You're now doing other things. What are you doing now? What's your big project at the moment? Yeah. So I've got a, my, my biggest part of my day job um, is I now run a venture capital fund investing in women um, in Africa. So we're back in Africa most of the time. Um, we've got a small project, hospitality project we're working on down here, uh, which is very exciting. Hopefully opening 2024, hopefully. Um, and um, my my day job is, is helping other entrepreneurs go on this crazy wild ride of scaling and growing a big business. Um, so I'm passionate about seeing women thrive uh, women think bigger than they usually do um, and helping them uh, make their big dreams possible. That sounds like a fantastic project. And how would people get in touch with you if they wanted to find out more, if they wanted to speak to you directly? Yeah, the best way is to contact me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So I'm at Sarah Dusick uh, on LinkedIn um, and you can connect with me there or send me a message. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Looking forward to seeing you very soon, Sarah. You take care of yourself. Thanks. Thank you.